Hi, everyone. Uh, very glad to see you all here. Some friendly faces on the front row also makes me happy. Uh, it's been a while since I've uh, been here. So you could technically say that I've been preparing for this uh, talk for 10 years now. I was here maybe back in 2011. So everything that I'm going to say now has led me up to this point uh, for over 10 years. So I'm going to shower you with ideas of an old madman with a beard that has uh, come to me over, over the years. Um, uh, I'm calling it uh, 10,000 hours taking care of business. So in my head, I was sort of going into this room and uh, on the loudspeakers with 10, taking care of business. Do you know that song? It's as old as me, yeah. Some, some people are nodding their heads. Some younger people think that's, that's a Justin Bieber song about 10,000 hours. But it isn't. It's a, it's a concept from uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, uh, where he um, launches or he, he sort of presents the idea that it takes 10,000 hours to master something. Uh, it, it, it might or might not be true. Let's see. My name is Ole Elnestam. I'm a software developer. Uh, I like problem dissolving uh, over resolving problem with the old same solutions. I like redesigning the system so that the problems doesn't show up at all. That's, uh, I do that because I'm a lazy bastard. I like collaboration over cooperation. I like being in the same boat as other people. I have this metaphor that I use uh, from sports that's uh, relay runs where you hand over a stick to the next person. That's cooperation to me and uh, collaboration is sitting in the same boat, eh? like a K4 rowing. Um, I like sooner over faster. Um, reminds me of, uh, of my youth when I played a lot of badminton and I played this old man, uh, maybe the age of myself now, uh, and he showed up where the ball was all the time. And, and he wasn't fast. He had uh, sort of a, a bit, bit of a belly. And uh, I just lost to him, uh, two straight sets. And, uh, and he said to me, Ola, um, maybe you shouldn't uh, uh, play that way. And I was like, I, I was trying to out outplay you. Yeah, but yeah, but you, I, I read you. Uh, I read where you were going to put the ball. So he wasn't very fast. He just uh, showed up sooner because he started earlier. And that's how I like to do software. I also like conversation over discussion. I don't like discussions. I like to uh, be respectful of people's time and listen to people. And, uh, and uh, as uh, probably you will see how these values, uh, I have sort of come to uh, the conclusion that this is what I value. And, uh, and maybe in the, during the the my sort of nine things I'm going to present to you and talk about, uh, this will be very prevalent there. And um, little did I know, back in 2010, when I adopted a code base, I like to say adopted now because I think code is more like a baby than a technical thing. You need to take care of it. It, can, it can't take care of itself. It changes over time. It, uh, I used to have a, a little baby, now it's a teenager. And uh, some of you know how, how it is to have a teenager at home. And uh, maybe some of you remember what it was like being a teenager, having parents that nag you all the time. <coughs> and little did I know that my uh, view of uh, technical practices and, and how I approach people would change uh, over these 10 years or 12 years now. And little did I know how profound those changes would be. So without further ado, let's go. I'm going to use this format during these 50 minutes. This is sort of the former me. Then I used to and uh, now I prefer to. Ten years later. Ten years ago, I used to overestimate what I could do in one year. I could probably change the world. I remember 
I came onto a team and uh, I was very sure that I could change the whole team. They, we were going to do the best software development ever. Um, uh, this, this was in a, in a team, was 20 people yeah, at a company that was uh, older than me, uh, been around for a while and um, no, I couldn't. Now I'm a more humble person. I'm humble to the fact what can happen over the course of 10 years. Ten years ago, or even fifteen years ago, I, I thought I could figure something out uh, beforehand. Uh, I was having this conversation with a with a friend, with a colleague. Uh, he's also a software developer, and he uh, he hit me with this. He said, "Yeah, if I'm going to uh, solve a problem, I'm going to spend fifty-five minutes figuring it out, and then five minutes on the solution." And uh, some people, they they uh, they attribute that quote to uh, Albert Einstein. Uh, he didn't say that, but uh, I'm going to use it anyway. Uh, it, it suits my needs. Um, so, what about us that hasn't uh, don't have the mental capacity of a genius? What about us? What what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to to fiddle around or sit sit and pretend to be solving a problem, thinking about it? Uh, so no, uh, I um, that doesn't that didn't fit me very well. So I I'm more of a guy that starts to fiddling around and um, and try stuff, and then I I realized I I can't really um, I can't figure out stuff beforehand. Uh, but I what what I do what I can do is remove corner cases. So here are uh, four business scenarios, real business scenarios from the small, uh, the niche bank that I'm working at. And uh, what about customers under age 18? How are we supposed to handle them? And there are a lot of rules. Uh, you need someone else to uh, sign, uh, sign everything. And then what happens when you turn 18 and you need to turn over that account or not a loan, I, I suppose. Uh, maybe you shouldn't take out loans on your kids' names. Uh, or companies as customers. How many people can withdraw money and do financial transactions with that company? And accounts with interest cap. Uh, when you reach, uh, let's say, 100,000 kroner, you get a l a less interest. There are so many things that are different for credits on accounts. That if you think about them, you, you can you can um, sort of go into analysis paralysis, and uh, that's that's usually what happens uh, to geniuses as well. So this is how I approach it now. I try to remove corner cases. I try to I ask myself and my colleagues, can we do with less data? Can we make the information, the data look more the same. Uh, so I if we do, we remove those corner cases, those ifs and elses, and the nested ifs and elses. So if uh, you're underage, and, and if you're not underage, and if you're part of a company. So if I can do with less information and less data, can I, y can I do with less data in the, in the, in the database? So I don't have to compare that much, uh, make it look much more the same and streamline what I'm going to do. And then sort of the, the big insight that I had, can I do it on my own? Can I do this without third party libraries? Can I do it with, uh, with less framework? Uh, and if I do, I, I need, I, I can travel much more, more lightweight. I'm much more nimble. I'm much more agile, if you, if you may. Uh, I, can, I can change my mind. I can change to how the business works. Or no third party information. I don't have to uh, communicate with other parties.
I don't know about you, but I get this question a lot. Uh, when can this be done, Ola? And uh, I came to hate that question so much that I tried to wiggle, it, wiggle out of it. It's like, ah, I don't know, maybe three weeks, and I, I, I put a date on it. I clearly remember a meeting five years ago, and someone said, okay, when can you be done, Ola? And I said, I can be done in three months, and I was very confident that I could. And uh, I didn't hear, hear from that person again uh, up until three months later. And he said, good, so are you done? And I wasn't because I hadn't even started. But he assumed that I had started. And uh, from, <laughs> from that point on, I was even more sure that I, I didn't like dates. And people slap a date on anything. Uh, they slap a date on stuff because of these events. They put a date on it because they're going on vacation. And it feels nice for them to be able to finish stuff before they go on vacation. Ah, I'm going to go on a one week sport club now, and uh, it'll be nice if the coders uh, finish this so I can sort of take my mind off it. So, Ola, can you be done by sport club yet? I don't know. Uh, or uh, we're going to have this huge marketing campaign, and uh, we really need this feature because if we do, we're going to get all the customers trademark 100% sure. Yeah. That's what's uh, going to propel us into the next 10 years of success. Probably not, but the people love slapping dates on stuff. So when I try to wiggle out of uh, date conversations, I, um, after three or four years, I, I saw cycles. I saw this recurring stuff. Oh, that, that guy, he's going to go on Sport Love again. He's going to come back to me now. It's like, no, uh, let's do that after Sport Love. Then we're going to have a corporate event. We're going to invite our 10 biggest customers, and we need this feature. Okay, but there's a corporate event, the, the exact same in three months. Maybe that's a better idea, because we don't want to rush into things. But then we have the legisl legis legislative events, like new laws. It's very, um, yeah, it's, it's there for, for banks and financial institutions. Uh, every uh, 1st of January and uh, 1st of July, the big, big dates, and those are, those are very expensive not to uh, abide by, uh, cost you 50 million kroner. So, uh, but I know, I know when the 1st of July comes, uh, every year, right after uh, June. Same thing about 1st of January, it's uh, right there at the end of December. And, and I can talk about that, and then we can say, okay, so is it very important? Yes, it's very important, okay. But the other stuff that you said was rea equally important, you know that's not gonna happen because of this new law, right? So, so let's, let's move away. Let's take that away from, from this. I've gone through uh, a, sh a change when it comes to release plans. And those of you who can see color, it's more green down at the bottom there. And I, and I like that more, more green is good. So um, 20 years ago, I loved to select features. Uh, I sat down with uh, business oriented people and said, okay, how many, how many of those features do you want? I can fit them all. Uh, and. Uh, I tried to, and then, uh, then, I, then when I thought, yeah, was, we're pretty much done. Let's release this beast. And I, uh, have you seen Pirates of the Caribbean? There's this scene where, where he shouts, release the Kraken! Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's what I thought about. Yeah, release this beast into the, into the wild and let it do its work. But then, it didn't really work for me. 
uh, I started enjoying Cadence every two weeks. <laughs> Release something. And uh, conjointly, I, I sort of did that every two weeks, the sprint length or something like that. Three weeks sprint, I released every third week. I li really liked that. And then I went to um, a conference in Southern Europe and there was this guy, he launched, he sort of pitched the idea with chunked releases. Well, we do something and then just release that. Well, that's br brilliant, brilliant. Uh, but yeah, it was still too big. Some of the chunks we, I tried to release was way too big for, for me to handle. And then uh, I, I discovered Cadence again. But, uh, no, uh, sorry, yeah, Cadence again. Uh, but this time, shorter, shorter period, one week. Maybe, maybe even three days. Release something every third day or every, I don't know, every minute. That's very, very small. But then we're down to chunk and finely grained. Okay, let's release mm, itsy bitsy, teeny weeny, yellow feature. And I used to think of plan releases, but now I do them uh, contiguously. And contiguous, is, it, it's a real word. It's not continuous beca because continuous means that you're doing it over and over. But contiguous also means that you're doing it something connected to something else. So you're continuing on the, on the same path, but you're, it's connected to the thing that you did before. And it, it, it rhymes real well with, uh, with changes in code because you're almost always certain that you're going to mess something up or, or going to, well, this is connected to this. So I call it, conti it uh, rather, I call it contiguous releases and contiguous is a real word. But there are three, th three strategies for me to do this. Set-based means doing s uh, two things at, at once. Uh, it's... Uh, there and also there are two ways doing two things at once for me. Dark releases, I release stuff to only a subset of users. They get a secret link or something like that. So uh, if a credit manager wants to do it in, in a different way, there's the, the regular way and a secret way. Or you can, you can do this with, uh, with unknown users as well. You can email people and, and okay, well, you can go go around and, and try this new st fancy stuff. And there's always the the side by side functionality. I, I'm sure you've seen that. If you're a Swedbank user, you've probably seen. Uh, there's a new version of Swedbank. Would you like to use it? That's side by side, and I think that's fine. You have two ways of doing th something. That's set based. I stole that from Lean Software Development. You can read a lot about set based. And uh, the, crit the, the the critical people is like, okay, well, that, that's way expensive, Ulam. Yeah, well, it. It might look like that, but you're going to you're going to sort of uh, reduce the uh, the errors a lot if if you if you're doing set based. And then there's set strategy two, rolling. I don't know if if it's a good word, but and the rolling means that we are doing something and then updating it. So let's take an API for for example. Uh, if we're to do an API change, uh, we communicate with a lot of loan uh, uh, the people that um, uh, s uh, compares loans. So if we if, if we were to introduce another uh, <coughs> parameter, uh, I'd uh, introduce an alternative. So let's say that we're going to use information. We have number of cars on our loan form. But we're going to introduce uh, car cost instead. So we're doing both. We introduce uh, car cost, and that's optional. And then after it's been running for a while, optional, we uh, make it required. And then we use uh, car cost and number of cars. And then we make the old way optional. And then we withdraw the old way. <coughs> that's the, 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 the audience facing API stuff. Uh, on the on the back end, your stuff, uh, we're going to store it alongside and then trust the new stuff and then uh, move over to the, uh, and, and then delete, de <coughs> delete the old way. <coughs> so contiguous releases, strategy three, parallel. Uh <coughs> 
This is doing essentially the same thing in two ways at the same time. So you're sort of tapping water and leading it into two pipes. And then at the end, you're sort of uh, putting them together again. So along the way, you can see, okay, we're tapping water here, checking the quality of the water. It's the same at both, both, uh, both the pipes. And then you're leading it together again. And then when you're happy with the new way, uh, you're going to uh, take the water from the new pipe, use it, and then you remove the old pipe. <coughs> this is one of my favorites because it means that I don't have to code the boring stuff because I have an excuse. Maybe you can, you can do the boring stuff. You're better paid than me. You do it by hand. Because ideas, they are very cheap. If you've done anything, uh, any work at all in uh, like a, what do you call it, uh, in, in a idrottsförening, you know that people tend to have ideas about how their, the, the soccer practice is going to be. Yeah, well, I know I think you should spend like 20 minutes on doing this and that. And they just pepper you with ideas. The same thing about software development. I'm sure I do, the, do it as well. But ideas are really cheap. Realizing them, on the other hand, is, is, is very expensive. But what's more expensive is, is keeping those realized ideas in production and those it's staggering. It's, it's, it's very expensive. So here's a sheet sheet for you. <coughs> you all know the JVM, the, the Java Virtual Machine, and I'm sure you have a BVM as well, where you run your ideas. It's very, a very, wow, uh, the rules, malleable. You can change them at any time. You can the support costs of running something in the brain. Very cheap, minuscule. Money making. Oh, yeah, this idea is going to turn events. Uh, probably not. And the performance is blazing. And the effects of the system, none. This idea stands by itself. It's not going to affect anything, but we all know that's not true. So I'm encouraging manual work. And I have this uh, seven-step process. For as long as I can, I, t I, I try to move stuff up into the manual process corner there. Sometimes uh, I think it's a good idea, and I agree with, uh, with the non-technical staff, the business staff, that, well, we need some user actions here. We need a button. We need a button. Okay, yeah, you're going to get your button. Maybe we can buy a third party, or if we've moved along this, uh, this process, and how much additional automation automation is needed. We've, we've sort of passed number seven there several times. We've ended up with a computer to comp computer thing. It's all automated. It's like auto giro. You don't have to think about it. It just happens. But getting there is really expensive. So that's why I encourage manual work. I stumbled across test-driven development uh, when I first read Kent Beck's uh, Extreme Programming, the white book. It's the closest thing to a Bible to me. And test-driven development was uh, presented, and it took me years and years and years to get. And then someone introduced and uh, pitched me the idea of 100% test coverage. Okay, well, not 100%, but really close to that. That's going to get you, you're going to be really confident about your software. 
but there are some diminishing effects of test driven uh, or, or test driven. But what does 99.x9s really tell you? Well, it tells you that you've spent a lot of time testing stuff. But joking aside, it, 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 it has some other merits as well. But I prefer something else now. I prefer reducing error surface. And now you're thinking, what the hell is error surface? Well, error surface is um, a sort of a way to visualize uh, errors in production or uh, side effects. Some, some like to call it bugs. I like to call it side, side effects. So the red one there, the big one, is uh, someone introduced uh, something that uh, had an effect on the business, an impact on the business that we didn't, didn't foresee or didn't want. Uh, big one, um, but uh, we managed to fix it by Wednesday. Uh, and but the, the medium one was uh, not that not that uh, big effect, not that big of impact, but it lasted two days, the f uh, full full two days, Tuesday and Wednesday. And then you have um, uh, the small one, kept rolling on for full week in production. Um, these have the same error surface. You can have small, small, small problems last for a long, 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 long time. And they produce the same error surface. <coughs> so I was um, introduced by this concept by a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, uh, Joachim, and uh, we started talking about it and said, okay, so how do you approach this? Uh, and now you need to hold tight because there's going to be a wall of text and we need to repair it. I like uh, acronyms. Here are two of my favorite. MTBF. Uh, it, it's, um, I don't say that to people. I say attacking from the left. Uh, mean time to recover, MTTR. I'm so sure there are people that say, yeah, 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 I know what you mean, but uh, that's attacking from the right, the error surface. Uh, and there's the more maybe vaguer concept is uh, attacking from above. Very popular in military tactics. And attacking from below. Or uh, uh, as many people say, said, that's lowering the bar, Ola. Yeah, w w we can't accept, uh, but really it's raising the bar because you're, uh, you're, you're pushing up. But that's not a bug, it's a feature. But really, it's, it's an approach. It's a valid approach. Uh, I used to laugh at it. No, 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 no. We need 100% quality. We need the best. Well, are you willing to pay for that? No, no, no. It's, uh, no. Uh, it's, it, it's supposed to be there from the beginning, but it's not. So, mean time between failure. That's how, how people usually operate. They don't want errors to happen at all. They don't want no error surface, so they test a lot. They uh, they don't put pe put things into production because they're afraid it might uh, have effects on the system. But uh, uh, you can reduce the lines of code by by any means. You can reduce the lines of code by removing stuff as well. And uh, if we're going to the meantime to recover, which is really where I think you should start if you want to attack error surface, is okay. We can roll back. We introduce something, it was wrong, we roll back. If you're getting good at roll back, you have a very, very solid ground to stand on when you, when you introduce new stuff. And then you start introducing smaller stuff. Uh, think about the elephant. Instead of doing elephant carpaccio, it's, it's the old joke, how do you eat an elephant? Right? One bite at a time. Yeah? So people, sh they want to do elephant carpaccio, thin slices, that's mean. We don't want to slice up an elephant. We want to shrink them and deliver really small elephants. And, and we 
we want to deliver one elephant at a time, not a horde of elephants, not even a horde of small elephants. And this one I came up with rather late, like announce the elephant. This little cute elephant is entering the system tomorrow. He's very nice. And one of my favorites is, if you have more than one way to do it, Tim Taudi, it's stolen from Pearl. Uh, you, can, you can have a buggy, one buggy feature, but the other feature, it works. Or the other way around it. If you have very competent manual process, uh, uh, competent people and manual process, you can, you can navigate around buggy stuff or, or, or effects that you don't want. I think this uh, next analogy is pretty, it gives you an idea of how old I am. Tom and Jerry, yeah? Oh yeah, okay. Some people have seen it. Uh, it's a mouse and a cat. And they're having fights. Very violent. Uh, I used to do the Tom and Jerry approach with, uh, with the people I, I was working with or, or partners. I was trusting the API docs. And I said, we're doing this. It's in the API docs. And I slammed the API docs in the head. Maybe. Uh, and, and it turned out that I was right a couple of times. But it also turned out that I was wrong a couple of times. I misread the API docs. Or I, I provided the API docs that, that wasn't telling the truth. Not very nice approach. So the, it's very painful for both, the Tom and Jerry approach of API docking. So now uh, I've turned to a better tool, according to myself. I log incoming data. I log outgoing messages and, and, and log it all and say, and then I can say, okay, so uh, you're saying that you sent me um, this message Tuesday morning at 8.34.15. Yeah, okay, I got it, I got it. Uh, you said you sent 24, but it says 42. And it was like, oh, damn. Or, yeah, well, it was 24, we said it. Uh, so we started out logging every incoming message. But then it turned out that we were sending crap sometimes. So we started logging outgoing messages as well. Uh, because people don't always trust what you're saying. Um, and after that, we, uh, we realized that... Um, Maybe we should log it in a database instead of files if a server goes down or if you, if you, if you replace the server, you, uh, you lose all the messages, the, the logs. And then we realized, okay, so we can't just log texts in database. It, it doesn't, it's not as valuable if, but if we knew this piece of data is money, we can, we know that, okay, 200 if it says 200 in a log, is it a response code or is it a mount? So we started being more precise about semantics. Okay, we're logging. Uh, and then we realized, okay, if we're that precise, uh, we, can, uh, we can resend messages or we can make calls to us idempotent, which means really that if you ask me to do something, I do it. But if you ask me to do something again, I don't do it if, it, if it's already done. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't add a new thing if you said, uh, I need a loan. And then you have a handle and say, okay, this is, this is, my, this is my number for this loan. And then, then you resend the message out of, uh, I don't know, because uh, a, a time, you thought it was a timeout or something like that. And this is interesting. I was uh, showing this presentation to my wife yesterday, and she, and she said, um, yeah, I, I need that for meetings. I, why can't I have someone logs, log everything that we say on a meeting, decisions? And then I can go back and like, okay, you did say that. And all these decisions led up to this bigger decision. And it's like, okay, you can have, you can have a, a, a scribe. I was like, no, 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 I want, I want computer stuff. I want computers to do this for me. Okay, I, I said, okay, yeah, you can, you can log it, I don't know, but are you that precise when you're talking to each other? 
do you have that semantic precision? It's like, ah, well, maybe not, maybe not. Maybe we say something like, oh, that's good. And this guy said, that's good. <laughs> so how do, you, how do you work with that? I asked my wife. And she said, well, okay, okay, okay. okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's not good for conversation. I said, maybe not. I don't know. Uh, but don't go to this sort of the Tom and Jerry approach. Don't slap things into the faces of each other. It's, 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 um, it's a nasty habit. Yeah, I've written code like that. Uh, I, I used to be paranoid about refactoring. Okay, I know I'm not the best programmer. Okay, yeah, I know, I know it should look better. I, I'll get around to refactor that. And uh, I know I'm also guilty of that. who wrote this piece of code, and then check the the commit logs, and only to discover it was me three minutes ago. <laughs> but I'm sort of okay. Well. I, I get better, I realize, I come to new conclusions. I, I call these idiomatic shifts. Idiomat idiomatic is, to me, it means the preferred way of doing something. How we prefer stuff. Uh, do, are we doing for loops? For eaches? Maybe we're working with streams? And uh, yeah, well, we prefer streams now. Okay, well, just make the magic wand, wave it, and everything is streams. If, you're, if you come across that tool, uh, um, I'm happy to buy it. Uh, we've tried uh, refactoring tools, powerful refactoring tools, but code looks so different, so you, you can't sort of make it all look the same. So <coughs> I, I spend a lot of time worrying about idiomatic shifts, and I've come to sort of this idea. I work with others, so um, I, need to, I need to keep in mind that they can't read my mind, I, I can't read theirs, so we have to discuss. But sometimes uh, it's really, really easy to see if, uh, if that's according to our idiomatic standards or something, if that's following the idioms, or if it's not, the visibility. Is it easy to agree upon Okay, this is good, this is bad. And there's also opinion. There's, all, there's opinions uh, on all software teams. Is this the good way, the preferred way, or not? And then you have this, uh, this way of, okay, so if it's not very clear to people if it's the good way or the bad way, and if, you, if, you, and if you're not, haven't formed an opinion yet as a team, you're down there to the, to the left, and you need to look for look for patterns and, and say, okay, let's agree upon how to use it. It's not until you agree in with your opinions, like, okay, this is the preferred way, this is the idiom that we want, and it's very clear that it's breaking that or it's not. And then, then you can remove or introduce the idiom that you want. So this is how I, th I and you need a lot of conversation to get from the, the purple part there up to the green part. Uh, if you don't, if you if you have a, a clear opinion, but you're not sure if this is the idiom you want, you juxtapose the code. You put it next to each other. So, okay, which do you prefer, this one or that one? Okay, we we prefer the streams. Okay, let's go for the streams one. So this is how I think about it, and I do want the code to be f feel familiar and look familiar. Uh, so I'm I'm. I'm willing to go through idiomatic shifts. But here's some uh, values around the idiomatic shifts that I sort of prefer now. I make them deliberate. And when we agree as a team that this is the thing that we want to do, um, we uh, start visualizing that shift. Maybe it's a number on a whiteboard. Maybe it's, I don't know, it's a number of post-its uh, that uh, has uh, some certain task of it. Maybe it's a map. And uh, three, that's the most idiomatic shift that I'm willing to 
take on at a, at a certain time. More than three, it's, it just becomes too much. Um, I don't know about you, but um, I have trouble reading two nested ifs. Three, it's uh, I'm taking a break. Feature flags is a way to sort of hide ifs from me, for me. Uh, I, I used to love it. I used to love a really configurable system. And I uh, was at this project 20 years ago. And I introduced a sort of feature flag. I didn't know it at the time, but it was a configuration. Uh, you could put it in a database. And at runtime, you can change it. Uh, if, is this customer one or two? Uh, I thought it would stop there with two customers. It didn't. Uh, so then came customer three, and uh, I sat at debugging stuff, and it's like, if customer equals one, do this, and I realized that um, if I kept hiding uh, ifs for myself, uh, I would rip all my hair off, and I kept hiding uh, ifs for myself. <laughs> Uh, now, now I've, I, I don't have any hair left, so I look for business scenarios. Um, what do I mean by that? <laughs> this is very... There's a fine line of repetition, as you can see. I tried to make it as thin as possible here, but so that you in the back still could see it. And there's this vague concept of how much repetition can we handle. Can we handle a little or a lot? And a uh, little repetition, it doesn't hurt anyone. Uh, a lot hurts, it, hurts people. Um, but there are different kinds of repetition, I realized. There's syntactic repetition, there's semantic repetition, and there's business repetition. I'm sure you can see syntactic repetition, like a for loop doing something, filtering customers, filtering potential customers. Is that the same thing, filtering customers and potential customers? It looks the same, it's the same syntax, but there's this, I, I, I see this in my mind now, it's a stream, you filter it, and there's a predicate there. Do you go through the hassle of making and extracting a method there, maybe doing a class, and just to reduce the syntactic repetition. I used to, but now I see there's semantic repetition. Well, that's a different thing. If I'm filtering customers here, and customers there, and customers there, that's semantic repetition, but filtering potential customers and customers, that's just syntactic repetition, maybe. But then there, I, ha I had this conversation with a friend, and she said, well, uh, she works at this Swedish big mining company, uh, and she said, we're fine with business repetition. And I was like, what? Well, we're fine with it, because uh, it, it's, it's more resilient. We can, do, uh, we can do, do the same thing in this little company and this little company as well. And, uh, and I was thinking about that, like, what? And what are the um, sort of effects on the business system if, you're, if you have the same concept, the same business concept? Yeah, well, it's, it might be more resilient, but it, it, it might also be a bit more expensive. So the, the drive, don't repeat yourself in a business, it's cheaper. But repetition is okay, it's, it's more resilient. And maybe you want resilient, and maybe you can spend more money. So I'm okay now with, with repetition. I'm okay with the different business scenarios that might look the same or slightly different and, and sort of copy them. And I'm a bit more okay with, uh, let's copy paste that idea. 
it might be a good idea. I was, I, I was very sort of strict before. No, let's not copy paste because I've had so many bad experiences from that, but maybe it's okay to copy paste stuff. So if I copy paste stuff, if I repeat business ideas, I try to go about it this way. I add a little code because I need to support that code. But I need to support that code, so I want it to be as little as possible, so I remove code as well. I try to take away craft. I try to remove business ideas. I ask the business people, so this one here, how many people uses that, really? How many people logs in uh, using um, a synthesizer? No one does. Really? Okay. Well, they used to do that back in the 80s. Okay. They log in with a sound. Okay, but we don't do that anymore. Or maybe something more uh, logging in using, uh, I don't know. But can we remove that? And they've said, no, 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 we need that, Ugla. No, well, okay, well, maybe you think you do, but it's very expensive for us to support that idea. How expensive? Okay, well, it uh, accounts for, I don't know, and I give them a number, depending on how much I really want that code to go away. <laughs> it's huge. <laughs> it's expensive. It's 200,000 kroner a, a, a day, month, a, a minute. I stumbled across this fantastic uh, conversation on the internet the other day. It was two women trying to exchange stuff over Facebook. I'm not going to go through the te detail there, but I read it and I, like, how can they even understand each other? Uh, one woman, she wanted Jortron Sylt, but she misspelled it so bad, I so she thought it was Hallon Sylt, and the other one had a. a <laughs> uh, <laughs> an old beer that was left over from the, this the weekend party. She wanted to trade with uh, goat cheese. Okay, still, so you know what I mean. Uh, people, people, yeah, you know what I mean, you know what I mean. And, and um, at the beginning of the project, I don't know what people mean. So I, I, I was really, <laughs> I was um, very into the idea of, uh, let's define everything. We need a glossary, we need this, we need that. We need, we need to, def do you mean when you say customer, what do you mean? Well, uh, I realized that defining, defining everything, you can't do that up front, uh, but we can talk about meaning. Topmost there is um, from sort of a, a couple, maybe, uh, where uh, probably the wife says to the husband, yeah, I, need to, yeah, I want you to spend less time at work. Fine, he says, signs up for a golf course. Maybe she wanted him around the house more because she liked his company. And maybe she could have said, can you spend more time at home? Uh, the bottom one there is from a, from a conversation. Yeah, we can, uh, we need this batch job faster. And uh, I spent 10 days optimizing performance of that batch job. Get it down from, I don't know, 10 minutes to seven minutes. Uh, what they really wanted was that report before 4 a.m. So I could just schedule it 10, 10 minutes earlier. And I wouldn't have to spend 10, 10 days optimizing it. And the, the middle there is, um, is some, someone saying, don't pay out that credit. Okay, I won't. Let's pay out all the other credits. But maybe it shouldn't have because uh, there was this huge problem. Maybe it was uh, because of uh, fraud or something. So. Positive action language, I've stolen that from uh, nonviolent communication, with that, which, which I can 
really recommend that you read if you're into a relationship or relating to other people. But positive action language is asking for what you, what you want. Instead of saying, don't, or uh, saying something that will spend less time at work. But what do, you, what, what do you really mean? What is your intention? So that, when it comes to meaning, talk about meaning and try to know what you're after. Try to figure out what you really want. Here it is. The nine insights, points that I was trying to make. Uh, it's uh, 12.01. I'll be here all day. Uh, we're having lunch. You're free to leave. <laughs> Thank you.